Hello and welcome back for another Torah Tuesday. Today we are in Exodus chapter 13 and we're picking it up in verse 11 until verse 16. We're continuing on in the ritual instructions of chapter 13. And if you haven't watched the first two videos in this chapter, you'll want to do that because they set up the overall structure of the chapter. And then the first panel, uh, verses 3 through 10, which talks about the Feast of Flatbread. And these verses concern the consecration of the firstborn to Yahweh, and they parallel that first panel. So it's helpful to watch the first two videos so that you can see that. Uh, today's video is, again, about the consecration of the firstborn. This is another ritual that is rooted in the Exodus event. I'm going to begin by reading from my translation from the Hebrew, and I might stop to make a couple of comments along the way as I read my own translation. So Exodus 13, verse 11. When Yahweh brings you to the land of the Canaanite, just as he swore to you and to your ancestors and gives it to you, then you shall cause to pass over to Yahweh all who open the womb, and all who open the womb of animal offspring that are yours. The males belong to Yahweh. So far, um, we you might have noticed that he only mentions the Canaanites. Last week he mentioned five nations, and here we just have the Canaanites. Canaanite is probably a generalized or generic term for all the people who are living in the Promised Land. And when they enter into the land, when they arrive, they're supposed to begin consecrating or dedicating to Yahweh their firstborn of both animals and humans. The phrase here opens the womb. Um, you, you shall cause to pass over to Yahweh all who open the womb. This is a different way of talking about firstborn. Normally we see the Hebrew word bakor for firstborn. This is a different phrase that focuses on the mother rather than the father. So in, instead of the um, firstborn of the father, it's the firstborn of the mother, the first the first one to come out from her womb. It isn't entirely clear whether the designation of males belonging to Yahweh is talking just about the animal offspring because that's mentioned last, or if it's all who open the womb of human mothers as well, those males belong to Yahweh. Clearly those who open the womb belong to Yahweh, but again, what's not as clear is whether both males and females would be included in that category or just the males. The phrase cause to pass over is one that we have heard before in chapter 12, verses 12 and 23. Uh, so this is an allusion to the Pasach or Passover. So in chapter 12, Yahweh caused to pass over or, or um, caused to pass by the families of the Israelites who had placed the blood on their doorposts. And here, the causing to pass over is what the parents do to the children or to the animals who now belong to Yahweh. So it's indicating a transfer of possession, but it's a similar word. Carrying on in verse 13. Every donkey who opens the womb, you shall ransom with a lamb. But if you do not ransom it, you shall break its neck. And every firstborn human among your children, you shall ransom. So this is interesting. The, first of all, the word ransom uh, comes from the Hebrew word pada which is to rescue from death via substitution. Many English translations have redeem as a way of translating pada. Redeem is a better rendering of the Hebrew word ga'al, which operates in family law. This is different. It's a rescue from death via substitution. So ransom, I think, is a better way of rendering what happens. So donkeys, let's talk about donkeys. Donkeys were not an approved sacrifice for the ancient Israelites. They were not a food source for them. They were work animals. They might have, in fact, been the only work animals for ancient Israelites. Or perhaps some people believe that the donkey would have been symbolic of any work animal that's not a sacrificial animal. So it's killed in a different way than a sacrifice. His blood is not offered, but rather his neck is broken which would have been a quick way to die. Normally, what people would have done would be to substitute a lamb, to ransom the donkey and not break its neck, but instead offer a lamb as a sacrifice. Lambs would have been less expensive, so it would have made a lot of sense to make that substitution. So that's what I have to say about donkeys. It's very important that we recognize that every firstborn human is to be ransomed. That is to say, children are never sacrificed 
in the Bible with Yahweh's command. Jeremiah 19 verse 5 makes that very clear. This passage also clarifies God's intention in Genesis 22 when he asks Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. We see here that that was a test, and it's called a test in Genesis 22. It's a test of Abraham's loyalty. It's a test of his faithfulness to God, um, but he, God never meant for him to follow through on, the, on that. And directly following this statement that the firstborn children need to be ransomed, we have an instruction about teaching the children. So picking it up in verse 14, when your child asks you tomorrow, what is this about? And by tomorrow is meant any, sometime, anytime in the future. When your child asks you tomorrow, what is this about? Then you shall say to them, with a firm hand, Yahweh brought us out from Egypt, from the house of servitude. When Pharaoh was stubborn about not sending us away, Yahweh killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from firstborn human to the firstborn of beasts. Therefore, I sacrifice to Yahweh all of the male animals who open the womb, but every firstborn of my children I ransom. It shall be a sign upon your hand and bands between your eyes, for with a strong hand Yahweh brought us out from Egypt. So the children need to be taught about this. As we said last week, at any point in human history, we are just one generation away from the extinguishing of biblical faith. And so teaching the children why we're doing these rituals is very important. Verse 9 in the previous instructions, the flatbed instructions, had talked about having a memorial between your eyes. In these instructions, um, they're supposed to have bands between their eyes. Some people think that this would have been like a, like a necklace, except instead of around your neck, like a pendant that you'd wear around your forehead. Um, and obviously the phylacteries of Jewish communities are, are one way of living this out. But what I want to point out is that the way it's expressed in verse 16 gives us an echo of what God did in Egypt. So in Exodus 7 verse 3 and many other places, it speaks of the signs and wonders that God did in Egypt, the Oat and Mophet that God did in Egypt. And here they're supposed to put a sign and bands on their bodies. They're supposed to put a sign on their hands, which is using the same word oat for the signs that God did in Egypt, the oat. Um, and the bands in Hebrew are totafot. And totafot sounds similar to mofet or mofet. Uh, so the signs and wonders rhyme with sign, the sign and bands that the Israelites are supposed to put on their bodies. So there's a wordplay going on. It rhymes. And this reminds us that the reason Israel dedicates its firstborn to Yahweh is because of the signs and wonders Yahweh did in Egypt by which he redeemed them, by which he ransomed them. And so now their first, firstborn of both human and animal belong to Yahweh as an acknowledgement that everything they have is a gift from God. Yahweh is the one who brings fruitfulness, so his provision must be acknowledged. And so this is an ongoing ceremony that will remind every family that their fruitfulness comes from God. I hope that this week, if you're in the U.S. and celebrating Thanksgiving, that you take time to express gratitude for all that God has provided for you. And wherever you are in the world, take some time out with your families to remember. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.